everybody, this is Martin Gerne from the Wikimedia Research Team. Welcome to our August 2020 Research Showcase. Uh, today, the theme of our showcase is readership and navigation on Wikipedia. And just to give some context about readers in terms of the numbers, sheer numbers, uh, every month Wikipedia projects attract more users on more than 1.5 billion unique devices from across the globe for a total of more than 15 billion page views. And to learn more about readers on Wikipedia, we have two fantastic talks today. First, we have Taha Yasseri, an associate professor at University College Dublin and longtime researcher on Wikipedia. And together with Patrick Gildersley from Oxford Internet Institute. They will give an overview on their work on the dynamics of popularity and attention in Wikipedia. Uh, for the second talk, we have Dimitar Dimitrov, who is a postdoc at Gezi's Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences in Cologne. Uh, Dimitar received his PhD with a thesis on modeling navigation on Wikipedia. And today he will share his work about the inter interplay between search and navigation on Wikipedia. Before we start, I want to mention that after each talk, we will have about 10 minutes for discussion. So we're happy to take your questions in the chat or on IRC. Isaac Johnson, my colleague from the research team, will monitor these channels and relay the questions during the Q&A. And with this, uh, Taha and Patrick, you're sharing the first presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for having me and for attending this uh, showcase. I'm very excited to be able to present to you today. Um, yes, yeah, thank you for the introduction to Wikipedia page view and navigation data, so I don't need to go through the details uh, to embarrass myself because I also don't know much about the technicalities. I've been always a consumer of this amazing data. Uh, a little bit of background. My, my research on Wikipedia actually started elsewhere. Uh, my first paper was about uh, the content of Wikipedia. I studied simple English Wikipedia and compared it to the main English Wikipedia to understand when we say simple English, what do we mean? And then I switched to editorial behavior. I spent several years studying uh, edit wars between uh, editors of different languages of Wikipedia. Um, so that was how I started um, studying Wikipedia, but then very soon I realized, well, there is a whole new side uh, to data that we can um, generate or is generated but we can use for research from Wikipedia and that is viewership. How uh, readers of Wikipedia, consumers basically, a much larger uh, pool of uh, individuals are using and navigating and reading different pages and whether we can learn anything from um, studying this data and patterns. So today I'm gonna give you a few examples, uh, four examples from the previous work that we've done. And uh, Patrick Gildersleeve, my uh, almost finished PhD student, is going to talk about his thesis that is about, uh, again, navigation on Wikipedia, but at a whole different level of uh, sophistication and uh, impact. Uh, uh, you will see. Um, uh, his, his work is really cutting edge compared to my updated old fashioned research. Um, so uh, uh, the, the idea initially was very simple. I, uh, I saw an article, I think by uh, Huberman and his colleague in which they use Twitter volume to predict popularity of movies. And I thought, oh, why not using Wikipedia viewership as a measure of popularity of movies and try to predict uh, uh, the amount of box office that they generate. Um, uh, so we wrote a paper, I'm going to go through it very quickly, but uh, it was quite exciting because the paper received lots of public attention. Uh, I have some examples here, The Guardian, The Hollywood Reporter, uh, not because the work was very sophisticated, because it was the beginning of big data, it was the beginning of an era in which we would use the data that is socially generated on 
social web to, uh, in this case, measure popularity and make predictions um, in advance uh, to an event. Um, know that you look at the paper, you might not understand this level of public attention because the paper is very simple. Uh, we basically looked at the page views and editorial data as they are shown here for two different movies, for example. Uh, zero is the release date of the movie and you see that both editorial activity increases over time and viewership activity. And when you compare among different movies, you see that the movies that are more popular uh, receive more viewership and receive more editorial ship. And so if you go back and take the data from a month before the release date, you should be able to make predictions about the popularities. Uh, we took quite a few features, uh, basically different measures and different counts, uh, including the page view, which simply says uh, how many times the, the article about the movie has been viewed within the day. Uh, we had the data as well for uh, about a year before the date of, uh, before the release date. When you look at the correlation of these different features with the actual revenue of the movie, you see that the highest correlation comes from viewership data. And that was surprising to me at the moment because I was very much carried away with editorial data who those movie geeks who write about, who edit Wikipedia about movies year in advance. But then for some reason, you see that page views are better predictors of the success of the movies. And today, when we think about it, of course, different reasons I could explain that the, the volume of viewership data is larger, the noise is uh, less, and uh, it's a better representative sample of the public audience who might go and watch the movie. In that paper, we used a linear regression model uh, to, to predict the first weekend box of its revenue. And we did a decent job, you know, for 2013. Uh, our predictions were quite close to the actual revenue here compared uh, with different colors. Uh, when you look at the actual revenue versus our predicted value, you see that there seems to be uh, a systematic deviation. Uh, so the data points are not surrounding the ideal predictions metrically, where uh, instead we see that for not very successful movies, we always underestimated uh, the revenue of the movie. And that can be explained simply by saying that for not very popular movies, there is simply not enough online activity. So we, because we relied entirely on Wikipedia viewership data and editorial data, so we kind of underestimated popularity of not very popular movies. But then for very popular movies, our predictions were quite close to the uh, actual value that came in a month later. So with that success, rather, uh, I can say rather successful work, the, I got a bit cocky and I thought, let's now predict elections because that's also another thing that people have been trying to predict for many years. Um, I wouldn't say we failed here, but we realized things are quite messy and complicated when it comes to elections. Uh, in this paper with Jonathan Bright, my colleague, we studied EU elections in Europe. Um, left shows the viewership of the page about the election over time. And we see that, for instance, first of all, a lot of attention comes very close to the election date. So unlike movies that we could see activities a lot earlier, uh, there are, when it comes to elections, people just remember there is an election going on uh, very close to the date, at least as far as we can see uh, based on the Wikipedia viewership activity. The other thing that we see here is the correlation between relative change in page views and relative change in turnout. Uh, and you will see later why we work here with relative change, uh, because apparently in political context, uh, viewership is not directly connected to popularity. Uh, the change in viewership is related to the change in popularity. Uh, when you look at uh, different parties uh, in different countries in, uh, in Europe and 2009 and 2014 data, you will see that uh, newer parties like BNP and UKIP in the UK, uh, FDP and AFD in Germany and so on, all the new parties that are emerging and no one knows about them, receive massive attention on Wikipedia. Uh, to support that, I have another diagram which shows uh, the parties that are new and the parties that have been incumbent 
uh, so all the other parties that were not new or incumbent are not present here. You see that the page view is much larger for new parties in green here, uh, whereas news mentions of the parties that we uh, counted from a different data source is much larger for incumbent uh, parties. Uh, and two colors are very well separated. Basically, Wikipedia serves as an alternative medium for introduction of the new parties, whereas known or parties that are in power already receive a lot of attention from mainstream media uh, and they appear on the news a lot more than other parties. Um, so uh, if I wanted to summarize the work uh, on, on election, basically attention picks very close to the election day. Wikipedia viewership is very much driven by curiosity. If there is a new party, the viewership is much larger than well-established parties. And uh, again, I couldn't show you the details, but we show uh, through modeling that Wikipedia viewership is correlated with the relative change in vote share, not the absolute vote share. And uh, to summarize all these three observations, we basically uh, came up with the st statement that voters are cognitive misers. Uh, they seek information only when they want to change their votes. And that's why Wikipedia page view is correlated with the change in the votes, not the absolute votes. Um, then let me move on to the next project, uh, which uh, we try to measure dynamics and biases of online attention to the case of ALN crashes. Again, that came from an observation. I remember one day I was coming to office and I read about the German wing flight, uh, if you remember in 2015, I guess. Um, and um, everyone was talking about the, the disaster and then I checked Wikipedia viewership. Mm -hmm and realized, well, there is a massive um, attention paid to the article about uh, the disaster and everyone wants to know about it. Uh, and then a few days later, it decays. Uh, what was interesting to me at the time was uh, that I checked viewership of other articles, other airlines, even British Airways, airlines that were not related to the event. And I could see a peak in the viewership anyway, which made me think it would be interesting to see how the attention ripples out from one article to all the other articles. But to get there, first we had to understand uh, the attention paid to a single event and single article. Uh, we studied about 1500 different flight uh, incidents that were covered in Wikipedia uh, around the world. And when you measure attention by through looking at the maximum viewership per day versus the number of people who died as a result of the airline crash, uh, you see that up to a certain point, there seems to be no relationship, but from 50 deaths on, there seems to be a, a monotonic relationship between number of people who died and the maximum level of attention. Uh, different colors show the different location of the operating airline. And generally you would see that blue dots uh, receive much more attention. That means that Ur European airlines, if there is a crash, they receive much more attention. So on average, a European death receives 26 times more attention than an African death. And to calculate this, we, we did not even include these two outliers here. Even without them, uh, the level of attention to uh, European and North American flights are much more than Asian and African flights on English Wikipedia. Uh, talking about the dynamics of attention, um, the theory suggests that the public attention should decay exponentially. Uh, that's an old theory. We wanted to test it. Uh, the best fit, the best results that we could get was through fitting three different uh, uh, lines in, on logarithmic scale, basically three different exponential decays. There is the first phase uh, where the event, it's the immediate reaction. Uh, it can be described uh, using one exponential decay. There is a communication phase when people are still talking about the event and the new information comes in. And then there is a the long lasting um, level of attention. Um, then moving on, uh, the question was how this current event uh, trigger attention to the past events. So these are the three flight disaster in 2015. Uh, but when you look at the viewership data of all the articles about previous events within the same time framework, you see that their viewership also increases. Uh, there is some spillover of attention. 
uh, even flights that have happened long, long time ago, but they have an article on Wikipedia, some of them are, the attention to some of them um, are triggered due to the current event, due to the recent events. We see all these curves jump up a little bit. So to quantify this, we define a flow of attention, which is basically the increase in attention uh, to the article about the previous or past events uh, in a time frame um, immediately after a new event happens. So this is attention flow, and we measured it for thousands and thousands of pairs of articles on Wikipedia. Uh, this is just a small sample of it. Uh, we see that some uh, airline, some incidents receive a lot of attention anyway. Sorry, uh, these are the triggered. Um, uh, uh, very often for uh, for basically any event that happens, uh, there is a lot of attention towards those past events. For example, um, September 11th incidents is one of those. Uh, and when we summed over all this spillover attention, it's interesting that the average attention to the past events is 140% larger than the attention to the current events. So people go to Wikipedia to read about what just happened, but a lot of them go and click on the links or search for other events. And altogether, this avalanche of attention could become even larger than the initial attention to the main event. So the question was whether we can model and understand the flow of attention. We divided the events into different categories. Uh, the events that were more recent, the ones that were older, the past events that had many casualties or the ones who had few, um, and uh, the prior active attention uh, to the old events, you know, that third phase of long lasting attention, whether those are events that generally have higher viewerships or not, and the ones who don't have much of viewership anyway, and so on. If the two events are from the same, uh, happen in the same country or they are in the same cat Wikipedia category, and it's so easy for me, you know, because I don't need to explain what Wikipedia category is. Uh, we see that, well, there are uh, meaningful differences between these different factors, and uh, they could explain why some events receive much more attention uh, as a result of a more recent event and some not. But then uh, uh, there was a little bit of rain on our bonfire because as Wikipedia enthusiastic uh, audience, you would know there are lots of hyperlinks. And we thought maybe these patterns could be easily explained just by having a hyperlink. Basically, we are not measuring anything but just the chance of clicks on existing hyperlinks. Well, that is true. When you look at the pair of articles that are linked to one another, or the recent event is linking to the old event, the view flow increases massively compared to the ones that are not linked. But even when you remove all those uh, pairs that are linked to each other, still you see all those patterns exist. Uh, they become a bit weaker, but they are still significant. Okay, let me wrap up this. Basically, I'm not going to describe this formula, but uh, we could model this flow of attention based on the prior attention to those target articles and uh, a coupling factor, which is basically the similarity between two events, the cause of the event, the location of the event, and the number of deaths in both events. To summarize this part, the level of attention is complex. Um, there is biases in it. Um, the dynamics is also complex. Uh, it's not a simple exponential. There are at least three different phases. Uh, we have short attention span, uh, and it's, I didn't show you the results, but we could see that it's independent from the impact. We, we forget about things usually within five to eight days, no matter how many people died and how big the event was. However, there is this kind of long-term memory that could be triggered uh, by new uh, events, and we can our attention could spill over to some events that happened 40, 50 years ago on Wikipedia, and that's a new thing. That's 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 uh, an internet-based uh, observation, and um, also from um, from modeling point of view, it is possible to come up with predictive models to explain and uh, basically forecast these attention flows between different events. Well, with that, I'd like to finish. And uh, I think I took way more than what I wanted. Uh, I pass to Patrick.
Hello. Um, I think I'm, you need to stop screen sharing before I start. Thank you. All right, everyone can see this? Yes. Great. Thank you very much, Taha. Um, so yes, um, this is work done with Taha as well, as well as my supervisor, Reno. Um, it's part of a side project at the start of my PhD and uh, one-ish of my PhD chapters. Um, Firstly, the side projects I'll be covering navigation patterns on Wikipedia, and secondly, I'll be covering, covering news events more generally and collective attention. So firstly, navigation patterns on Wikipedia. So how does the organisation of information on Wikipedia shape user traffic? Um, this is based on this conference paper. In the same way that roundabouts and intersections and junctions uh, shape vehicle traffic, do particular pages fulfil certain roles in shaping traffic on Wikipedia? To study this, we use the Wikipedia clickstream data, which is month-long counts for transitions on hyperlinks between all Wikip English Wikipedia articles. So it counts the number of times that people click from an origin page to a destination page. For example, um, 57 people in this month clicked on the link Aristotle from the page Homer. From this, you can find a network of Wikipedia articles where the nodes are the, uh, these dots are the articles and the edges, these arrows, indicate how frequently people uh, move between each page. We study these networks. We consider two main features based on the volume of traffic each article um, generates and the shape, um, the, the way this traffic is distributed among lots of different articles. So we look at the volume of traffic and think about this sourcing coefficient. So how frequently people click out of an article and how frequently people click into an article. If a page um, acts as a sink, sorry, if a page uh, receives many clicks but doesn't uh, send people to many other places, it acts as a sink. If a page receives few clicks but sends lots of other people, sends lots of people to lots of other places, it acts as a source. We also consider the diversity of traffic through articles. So this is how much the traffic is spread to a wide range of articles or a narrow range of articles, but not necessarily uh, how much total traffic there is. We look at the spreading coefficient, which is dependent on entropy. Uh, don't worry about the maths too much, but essentially a low, spreading, a low spreading coefficient means that an article receives traffic from a wide range of other articles and sends it or focuses it to a narrow range of other articles. And the largest, spreading coefficient means that an article receives traffic from a narrow range of articles and spreads it to a wider range of articles. You can think about how different kinds of Wikipedia articles might do different things with this uh, under this kind of typology. So most Wikipedia articles don't spread traffic very much, but there's, sorry, most Wikipedia articles have a narrow range of spreading, so they don't act as bottlenecks, they don't act as distributors but there is a wide range of uh, source and sync behavior. So some people uh, yeah, so some, some people stop browsing on lots of Wikipedia articles, some people start browsing on lots of Wikipedia articles, but that's not a particularly deep and meaningful observation. We want to see how this changes by different article types. So we look at several um, as an example here. So list pages, disambiguation pages, ography pages, which um, refer to discographies, filmographies, and trending pages, so um, articles that are in the news. We said that, that there are different sourcing and spreading behaviors associated with these article types. And we can also use these plots to identify deficiencies and errors in the article network. So high sync behavior, sorry, sync, sync behavior or bottleneck behavior can indicate that there is a, there's an editing error, that a link isn't properly, um, doesn't have the correct destination. We can also see other deficiencies such as um, disambiguation articles possibly being unnecessary when they focus attention when really we should be expecting disambiguation articles to be uh, spreading people to a wide range of articles which have um, similar names. So conclusions from this study, we have different navigation patterns for uh, different article types, and we use this sourcing and spreading behavior to identify deficiencies and errors in the article network. So this is a demonstration of wider network science using network traffic to study the underlying structure. And this is implications for Wikipedia because most of these uh, article types I've referred to are emergent from um, editor decisions. I don't think, as far as I'm aware, that there's very much uh, prescribed Wikipedia um, admin level. Um, pages have to be um, along a certain structure, along certain lines, which means that um, maybe greater thought is needed into how we best uh, design Wikipedia such that uh, people can efficiently find um, what they're looking for, which I think Dimitar will talk about more later. 
So the second study is on news and collective attention. So a couple of weeks ago, I was on Twitter and I saw this tweet from a big tech CEO you might be familiar with. Um, as usual, I learn as much from the Wikipedia articles about breaking news events as I do from the news itself. Now, Wikipedia is not a news website, as it states uh, uh, in the About section, but people do use it for um, information searching around news events, as, um, as the CEO does, of course. I, said, I want to study this behavior, so how do people browse Wikipedia in, re in response to news events? So, as I said, Wikipedia articles are very different from news articles. There is not typically one Wikipedia article which summarizes every single event. Um, and usually people browse lots of different Wikipedia articles with no particular bound or limit. Um, but it's hard to say which Wikipedia article, articles they browse, which groups of them they browse. I want to detect which groups of Wikipedia articles are accessed together in response to a news event. And persistent groupings across time may represent news topics. So we look at how to best identify topics and new, um, news topics using Wikipedia. And once you do this, you can establish, compare this to established news agendas. The data I use is one year, one year of events, um, totaling over 4,000 from the Wikipedia current events portal. Here, there are daily entries for um, popular events of the day with linked um, Wikipedia articles uh, in the description. Now, it's easy to get networks of articles from each event using all links into and out from these articles, but this would include very many lots of um lots of irrelevant links to be honest um and we've got to think about how to effectively prune this network to identify which um which groups of articles are meaningful um to the network meaningful to the event to do this i use an approach called community detection so i take into account the article network structure and look for groups of articles which are well connected with each other. In this example, there's a well connected cluster over here, a well connected cluster here, and this, uh, this pendant, which like, is not well connected to any of them. So community detection looks to uh, identify these. The hyperlink network, where the articles are the nodes and the edges are the hyperlinks between the articles, is representative of more long term effects from news. No, so long term effects, not representative of news particularly well. An alternative approach could be to look at the page view correlations. So if several articles exhibit correlated page views, similar page view patterns, it's likely that they're related to the same external stimuli, the same news events. You can also um, cluster groups of pages using this approach. And this is more representative of short-term effects. Now, I want to take both of these things into account. I get the groups of articles that are strongly connected and have similar patterns of page views. I won't go into details over here, but I can maybe explain later. Um, and once you do this, you can identify um, the topics of attention on Wikipedia, more specifically news topics, given the uh, given where I sampled them from. So the top news topics on Wikipedia as measured by number of occurrences on the current events portal listed here. And we also have the top news um, topics by uh, page views they generated. And this matches up with a lot of, you know, top news stories, top news topics, um, lists, of, um, lists of the year. I'm looking for a more robust way of comparing this against other news agenda, but it, it the results are really nice, really meaningful. And yeah, so you can use these topics and study them um, later on in my PhD, which I'm doing. So the conclusions and further work we're gonna be doing. So Wikipedia is not a news website, but it is an important news information resource. The patterns of browsing on Wikipedia reflect wider news agenda and detecting these news topics allows further network level study, such as clustering events and topics based on the dynamics towards them and predicting the page use towards all sorts of different events, which is the rest of my PhD. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Taha. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, we have we have a bit over time, but we still have a little bit for questions. Uh, as a reminder, if you have some questions for the speaker, please put them in the chat or on IRC. I will first uh, ask in the room. Anyone here has would like to pose a question? Otherwise, I would ask Isaac if there is if there are questions from IRC or YouTube. 
Yeah, um, we do have some questions from YouTube. Uh, the first one for Taha, um, and it concerns the uh, like peaks and pay views around election day. And the question was um, kind of how that relates to Google Trends and what sorts of differences you're seeing there and why. Hmm. Uh, that's very interesting because um, we also, in the same work, in the same line of work, we also used uh, Google Trends data. There is a high correlation between uh, Google Trends and Wikipedia page views. Uh, from practical point of view, it's much easier to use the data from Wikipedia because, you know, um, on Google, people can use any keywords that they think is the most relevant. Uh, for example, in the context of UK politics, uh, Conservative Party, Tories, Boris Johnson, uh, all sorts of different names could be indicating of interest in the same party. Uh, on Wikipedia, this, uh, because of the redirects and because of the way that navigation uh, happens, all this data would be aggregated into one statistics. So in that sense, is a much more organized sort of uh, data frame for us to work with Wikipedia data. Great. I'll just keep going then. Thank you. Um, the, there is this one's a more, I think, technical one, but just asking, you mentioned there is an exponential decay model of attention um, and just asking for a few more details about what that model specifically was. Sure. Um, this model is uh, basically uh, suggested by German uh, psychology, social psychologist Hermann Ebbinghaus in um, late 19th century, uh, which suggests that there is an exponential decay in public attention. Um, so since then, there hasn't been much more advancement in the theoretical work, uh, but there has been uh, lots of uh, empirical work to either to extend this model or to uh, basically validate the model. Thank you. Uh, and this one I think is a little bit kind of broader than um, the question was, you know, and if folks watch the research showcase from last month, we talked a little bit about this, but page view trends and, and COVID-19, and they were essentially asking to what degree, you know, page view trends might be able to give us insights there. And I guess I would kind of broaden this out to be more generally, how do we think about um, what sorts of events page views are useful for, um, like the movies that you mentioned versus ones where maybe there's a, it's just too complex to really pull out useful tidbits from? Very good question. And of course, we all thought about this, um, uh, whether we can use Wikipedia traffic data to say something about the outbreak of the, of the, of the disease. Uh, well, there has been work uh, um, to do similar predictions for flu in the past. And I'm not talking about Google flu, I'm talking about the work that used Wikipedia data to predict flu uh, uh, outbreaks uh, in different countries. Uh, well, as Patrick mentioned, and also our work on election shows, there is a very complex interaction between mainstream or news media and Wikipedia viewership. Sometimes they complement each other and sometimes they trigger each other. Uh, when it comes to pandemic, I think at the moment, uh, because of the whole uh, uh, information overload that is happening on mainstream media, social media, uh, what we would be measuring would be mostly a reflection of uh, public attention rather than a reflection of the number of cases or people who are actually exposed to the virus. Whereas I think initially in early days, uh, uh, people who could, uh, look at the page view statistics of symptoms, for example, coughing or tiredness or uh, all the other symptoms, I think it would have been uh, possible to at least have very strong signals indicating that in which regions and in which language uh, uh, editions are basically we see more uh, traffic to those pages. And I already mentioned the very last technical point that uh, geography is really important in pandemic predictions and uh, we know that, and you guys at Wikimedia know better than me, that there are limitations into geographical information that we can have on Wikipedia uh, viewership data. Do you want me to keep going, Martin, or shall we? No, I, I saw in the RC that Leila had a question. 
or remarks? Uh, I'll leave it for the to? end. I think in the interest of time, I think we can, I, I can have my questions remarks all at the end for all speakers. Okay, great. Otherwise, Isaac, are there still open questions? Otherwise, we could also move to the next talk in case you no. don't have anything. I'll do a quick one uh, for Penny. Let's do one more. Let's do one more. Yeah, yeah and this re uh, regarded using the, um, the peaks to retrieve events from Wikipedia. And I think the question is essentially um, how real time can you do that? Uh, if that makes sense. So you can do it obviously looking back on the year, but uh, when thinking about actually like tracking events that are popping up, how, how possible is it? So um, I've not tried this in practice, so I guess it's maybe, maybe also a question for you guys as well. It's, it's dependent on the um, on how readily the Wikipedia um, Wikipedia hourly dumps will be uh, are available, right? Um, I guess, um, because my approach is dependent on the um, on the network structure and the page views, it, requ it, requ it requires both. So it so you can't just simply monitor an interview page, wait for wait for an edit for the art, for for the um, for a hyperlink to be added, and then run the procedure. It is dependent on the um, on the page view dumps being available. So the API makes that available the day afterwards. I think. Um, Okay, thanks again for the questions. Then I think we will move to the second talk and to the third speaker. Dimitar, if you are here. Yes, can you hear me? Go ahead. Do you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm really happy uh, to present in the Wikimedia Research Showcase and I will basically continue where Patrick, Patrick uh, stopped. And my talk is about uh, the interplay uh, between search and navigation on Wikipedia and uh, how, uh, how they shape the traffic and what role articles uh, uh, on Wikipedia play for shaping the traffic. Um, the talk is based on a paper called Query for Architecture, Click Through Military. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Florian Lemmerich, uh, Fabian Flock and Marco Stromaya. Florian and Marcus are uh, from RWTH in Aachen and uh, Fabian is a colleague from Gizist. And um, yeah, um, let's start with the question. How do actually people access information on Wikipedia? Um, basically, they are uh, two information access forms you can search. Uh, you can use a search engine, type a query, and uh, normally you get uh, a Wikipedia page as a result, or very often, and then you can click on it, and then this is how you enter Wikipedia. Once on Wikipedia, uh, you can use links, you can follow links and uh, navigate uh, the content. Uh, and first, um, if, we, if we look at, at, at the uh, log data, uh, we can make an observation that 70% uh, of all visits on Wikipedia come from, uh, from search, and 30% of all visits are from navigation. Uh, this observation uh, leads to the question, given an article, uh, how do search and navigation interplay to shape the traffic? And which article properties are indicative of specific information access behavior? Uh, to answer these questions, uh, we uh, use the Wikipedia clickstream data set. This data set uh, um, contains referral resource pairs extracted from the server log of the English Wikipedia from August 2016. Uh, it contains about 3 million articles and 4 billion views. Uh, and this table here shows you basically how the data looks like. Uh, you have a resource uh, um, article and you have a referral and the referral can be uh, a search engine such as Google or Yahoo or internal uh, or a Wikipedia page, right? And based on the referral, uh, we can mark each entry in the data set as search or a navigation entry. Um, and to answer the question, which article properties are indicative for specific information access behavior, we, uh, uh, we followed a methodology of three steps. The, in the first step, uh, we introduced two traffic features based on which we then define article roles. 
Um, and the second step, uh, we uh, we study the effect of, uh, of, uh, of topics on the on the on the traffic and uh, adopted for that uh, topic specific heat maps. And finally, we model the the in the access behavior um, and uh, we looked which features contribute to certain uh, uh, access, uh, access patterns on art. Um, Okay, what are actually the functional roles that actually that uh, articles can assume for the traffic flow on Wikipedia? Uh, we defined uh, two features to uh, to understand that uh, two traffic features. The first one is the search share. This is basically the amount of views that an article receives by search, uh, and um, this is defined as the quotient between the incoming search uh, traffic divided by the incoming search and uh, uh, and the incoming navigation traffic, basically the total page views of the article. And the second feature that we um, introduced, we call it resistance. And this is basically the ability of an article to relay traffic to other Wikipedia articles. We define it as one minus the outgoing navigation traffic divided by the again, by the sum of incoming uh, search traffic and incoming navigation traffic. Um, if we look at the distribution of those two traffic features, we see that uh, uh, we, for search here, we have a, an average of 66. Uh, and uh, for resistance, we have a, a higher value of 88. So this means that basically uh, uh, many of the articles don't uh, don't uh, transmit clicks to other or uh, traffic to other articles. Um, now, using this um, these two traffic features, we can uh, uh, we can characterize the articles and their roles with the traffic. We can do this by creating this search and resistance uh, space, and we divide this space into different regions uh, for the traffic for uh, for the articles. Uh, based on the, the averages for each uh, traffic feature. And we have, uh, and we get basically four regions. The first one is the region with high search share and high resistance. Uh, this is, we call it a search exit region. The articles in this region are, are basically accessed through search and are rather unable to relay traffic. Then we have search relay. Uh, uh, region of the search and resistance space. The, the articles in this region uh, are also accessed through search, predominantly by, by, through search, but they also relay traffic to other Wikipedia articles. Um, analogously, we can define navigation relay and navigation exit uh, uh, for, uh, for articles that have uh, under the average search share. Uh, and uh, uh, under the average resistance and for uh, under the average uh, search share and over the average resistance respectively. Um, now, knowing the different roles and different uh, in, in which regions uh, articles sit on this re uh, or occupy in this search and resistance space, we uh, let us look at the page views each of those regions re uh, achieve. And the, the heat map that I show you now uh, sh shows basically the number of uh, views achieved by articles with the given search and resistance values. Um, the heat map depicts the general access behavior for Wikipedia uh, with respect to the traffic features and warm colors here indicate high uh, view numbers uh, in the respective bin of the heat map while cold colors indicate a low number of views. As you can see, we have a very high number of views in the left upper corner. Um, uh, and um, this is basically, this indicates that uh, the general information access behavior is dominate on Wikipedia is dominated by search. And we have a lot of lookup search behavior. Uh, however, if we look more closely, we see that articles uh, in the search relay uh, region account for 37% of the views on Wikipedia and articles in the navigation relay region for uh, uh, um, account for 39%. Um, this spreading out pattern 
tells us that Wikipedia is actually good and uh, is able to transform external traffic from search to internal navigation traffic. Um, although this analysis that I just show you uh, um, give us already some insights on the interplay between search and navigation, it does not reveal which article properties are characteristic for specific uh, patterns, success patterns. Um, and in the paper, uh, we, we looked at three different groups of article features, uh, network features, content and edit features, and uh, topic features. Uh, and for now, I would uh, like to focus on the topic uh, feature. And um, the natural question here is actually, are topics accessed differently? Um, what you see on this slide is uh, for, e for each of the 20 topics, uh, the, the, the achieved uh, search and resistance values and how this deviates for, from, the, from the mean of the respective tra traffic feature. Um, and what this slide actually tells you is that there are pronounced differences in the uh, preferred uh, information access behavior on uh, traffics uh, on topics uh, on, on articles from different topics. Um, to better understand how exactly the uh, the access behavior from uh, from uh, on articles from a given topic deviates from the general access behavior. We adopted the following approach. We adopted these topic-specific heat maps that um, uh, basically we created uh, for each topic uh, uh, a heat map uh, for the search and resistance space. And we divide this heat map bin-wise uh, uh, by, the, by the general access behavior heat map that I showed you previously. The result then is, shows the deviation of the topic specific heat map from the general sales behavior. And here uh, you see that, uh, in red or uh, over representation of views and uh, in blue under representations. White means no difference. White colors indicate no difference. Um, now I would like to show you uh, two examples uh, uh, for uh, search heavy and navigation heavy access behavior. Uh, uh, and uh, the f this would help us to understand and answer the question what role actually uh, the topic plays for the traffic on Wikipedia. Um, the heat map that you, show that, that you see here is the heat map for the topic architecture. And we see that we have a, a over-representation of, uh, of page views in the regions of uh, search exit. This means that uh, articles from architecture are accessed uh, through search and uh, then will go away. They don't click further. Um, and on the, on the other side, we have also topics like military that, we, that contain uh, historical articles and we observe a totally different pattern here. Uh, we have a overrepresentation of views in the region for a low uh, search share and low resistance. Uh, and this indicates a, uh, a navigation heavy uh, uh, behavior, access behavior. And this is actually how we came up with the title uh, for the paper, query for architecture and click through uh, military. Um, now to the final part um, of my presentation. Uh, here we look at which article properties are indicative of specific information access behavior. And uh, as I said, we, uh, we fitted two models for each of the traffic features and uh, looked how different article properties uh, influence the, the, the predictive performance of our models. Uh, and more precisely, given an, an article, uh, we would like to know whether uh, it will exhibit a search heavy or a navigation heavy behavior. Um, and for the resistance feature, uh, for modeling the resistance feature, again, given an article, we would like to know whether the article will act as a relay point and forward traffic to other articles or uh, 
basically navigation will, will die on this article. Uh, and the article will be an exit point where users will basically leave, uh, uh, leave uh, Wikipedia. Um, now to the results. Uh, this plot shows you the results that we achieved for area on the curve for search here. And uh, for each group of features, we fit the separate model. And also for all features, we fit the model. Uh, and what we see here is that uh, the article topic is indicative of uh, search share. Um, on the other side, the results for uh, uh, resistance, um, we see that uh, the content and edit features are indic indicative uh, for, uh, of resistance. And also we see that the position of the article in the network and how is it connected uh, also contributes to resist to, to be, being able to predict better resistance. Um, now to the implications of our work. Um, one of the goal of, goals of Wikipedia is to educate people and to democratize knowledge. And in this light, uh, identifying articles that act as exit points can be valuable uh, for efficient allocation of editor resources, for example. Improving such articles can help retaining users on Wikipedia and providing better user, user experience. Uh, our work also provide design, uh, provides insights for the design of uh, user interfaces and new Wikipedia features. Um, I know that Wikipedia is rather cautious with big changes in the interface and in the layout. However, one might consider lightweight changes that could be eventually switched on and off by users. For example, topic specific lay layouts or highlighting of links leading to, to different to articles from different topics. Um, a couple of years ago, um, Wikimedia uh, or Wikipedia introduced the, the preview feature that uh, basically gives you a short description or give you give you some insight uh, where a links where a link would lead to what kind of article would lead, uh, and um, um, the, those preview uh, this, this preview feature normally does not contain uh, links. This Wikimedia might consider changing that. Uh, I know that this this feature was introduced to prevent users drifting away uh, while navigation. But if we know that uh, uh, the user is on an article that is basically a search exit point, we might consider adding links on those previews. Um, another, um, uh, another implication of our work is, and I, I know actually that the Wikimedia is doing a lot uh, to prevent vandalism on, uh, on Wikipedia, and there is a lot of research uh, in this direction. Um, the topic specific heat maps that, uh, or the approach that, uh, um, I showed you uh, can uh, or can be probably additional tool that uh, support uh, and prevents uh, vandalism on uh, Wikipedia. And this is my last slide. Um, to summarize, uh, we studied the interplay between search and navigation on Wikipedia. We saw that uh, Wikipedia is good at converting external search traffic to internal navigation traffic. Uh, search and navigation are used to access different uh, articles from different topics and uh, um, uh, and finally I think that both uh, information access forms are crucial and they complement each other um, and that's it from my side and I will be happy to take questions great thank you Dimitar um... I would open up the floor for questions here in the room first. I have one question. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, my question is, have you considered looking into other languages? I, I just looked at the paper and I see that you have used clickstream data. And I wonder, for example, have you considered using Japanese as a comparison language to see if the results that you're seeing on English Wikipedia is 
sustained as you go to other languages? Um, we haven't done that, uh, but I know uh, um, that the Japanese Wikipedia is, the network structure of the Japanese Wikipedia is really different compared to the English one. Uh, this, uh, that's why I, I really cannot say much how the access behavior would, or this will be just a speculation, how, how uh, the patterns will look like there. Um, but also one could think about um, other languages like Farsi, uh, uh, where also the, the structure is different and, um, and the, the presentation actually of the content is also different from left to right, right? So it's, uh, this might also play a role. Um, and yeah, this will be definitely something interesting to, to study. Yeah, and the reason I'm saying this as a, as a follow-up is that your study uh, on its own is very valuable. If you want um, Wikimedia Foundation to kind of look into it more and look into what we can learn from your study so that like we, uh, we possibly consider like product changes, for example, by product managers, uh, we need to see if the result is something that is kind of consistently present across languages or if it's more kind of language uh, specific. Um, when things become more language specific, they're generally, those are the places that we try to stay out because uh, we are the kind of central system that can do some things well across many languages, but if it's something very language specific, it's usually better to work with the communities to see what best uh, can be done with that result. In this case, I would say if you're not planning to expand your study to other languages, my recommendation would be just for you to present the results to English Wikipedia, and I would be happy to share with you links like about where to do it, although Fabian is uh, probably more knowledgeable than I on that front. Um, you can communicate to the community um, and then let them decide what they want to do because they have a lot of editorial choices, right? They can decide, for example, if they want to highlight a link more than other or, or not. Yeah. Thank you. It's a it's great study either way. I was just asking uh, what are you considered? And depending on the path, you may have different options. Yeah. And um, yeah, we. We haven't done uh, any, so my focus also shift, shifted after defending the PhD a bit. So, uh, but yes, this would be definitely an interesting direction to pursue. If I might jump in on that, it's all right. Um, I looked at a little bit of um, TIFF language clickstream data when I was starting off with my version of the project. Um, and I found that the there's a there's a ten artic, sorry there's a ten click per month uh, cutoff um, on the links that are on the links that are recorded, and I found that had uh, like a very different effect on the different languages, which meant that because there are you know fewer users, fewer browsing fewer browsing users on different languages, which meant that it was hard to initially compare between them. So some sort of like normalization was needed and. It got too complicated, and I shifted focus, and then it was straight, 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 straight on it, straight on English language at Wikipedia. Um, I don't, I, I don't know if anyone in the comments or questions has any, has any, um, has any experience with, with with that as well. But the, um, but the the threshold seems to make some sort of difference, the, a great difference to the other language Wikipedias, which wasn't present when you just took the hyperlink network. Yeah, I think the cutoff is also. It's it's a really important point here to make, uh, especially when we think about or we look at access patterns from navigation uh, at uh, articles with low views. This is where we uh, we should be really cautious with with the patterns that that we see and observe there. But I mean, uh, Wikipedia have the has the Wikimedia has the data, the full data. We were just looking with at the clickstream data set that had just has this for privacy reasons, I guess, this cutoff. Isaac, are there questions from YouTube or IRC we would we would like to pass on? Yeah, a few from YouTube. Um, the first one reg is regarding the navigation exit behavior um, and just thinking about, you know, to the degree that 
maybe you, you might want readers to spend more time on Wikipedia. Um, whether you think adding like wiki links to a page would shift this behavior or what sorts of like changes would you make around con the content on the page itself that might have an uh, impact on this behavior? Um, yeah, um, this is interesting question, definitely. Uh, introducing Wikimedia has, has a policy uh, how links are set uh, and um, introducing just more links, I don't think this would be um, uh, a way to go. Probably just highlighting links uh, would be something interesting and uh, but I think there are there is an A-B testing probably in this case needed. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, the other one, uh, so you showed military history and you showed architecture and you see these kind of grand differences. And the question was about um, to what degree uh, can you actually like predict the topic of articles based upon these uh, this navigation and this access behavior? Um, whether you know, do most articles show kind of a mixture of all the different types, um, or are they really like quite stark differences between most topics? Uh, so, so the question is uh, actually the other way around. Uh, so having the topic, whether we can predict. Uh, well, so if you knew, if you had a bunch of articles that are linked together and you knew about their navigation behavior, would that tell you anything about the topic? Is that like a fingerprint or? Um... Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't done that, but I think this might be possible. Um, yeah, I, I think that, for example, uh, article topics such as uh, TV and movies would be probably uh, predictive for uh, more lookup behavior. Uh, but I also know that those articles uh, also are able to, to, uh, to inject traffic uh, at the same time. So I, I don't know, I, this, is, this is a definitely interesting question that I haven't looked into. Are there any other questions here? I actually wanted to get have a question for Taha, I think, um, getting back to the first set of presentations. Um, something I've been thinking about, so uh, there's this concept of data voids um, where, uh, you know, there's articles that um, or like content spaces that don't have much information about them. And then there's a sudden jump in interest in that area, either because of an event or because like a term is taken over by a certain group. Um, and it's this opportunity where people sometimes kind of, uh, you know, can inject misinformation in the space because you also have a bunch of people searching for something, um, but very little content. So it's very easy to kind of um, affect what people are seeing when they search for the term. Um, and this doesn't necessarily happen on Wikipedia, you know, it happens outside of Wikipedia too. Um, but, it, you know, and you were mentioning kind of uh, as parties uh, receive more interest, you know, you see this kind of spike in page use as people are kind of first learning about them or maybe specific politicians. And I wondered if you had any thoughts around um, like how would you go about identifying the universe of like political articles that um, aren't receiving attention yet, but like potentially you could begin to see the spike in attention. And so you might want to try to get ahead of that and improve the content quality in advance. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think a, a similar uh, term that is being used in uh, the context of science of science is the sleeping beauty papers, you know, papers that have been out there for many years and out of the sudden someone starts citing them and then there is a burst in the citations to that sleeping beauty paper. 
Um, I think it, it's similar and it's very interesting. Uh, in both cases, it's very hard to make a prediction. Uh, however, I think Patrick's work uh, eventually would take us as close as possible to this because uh, he's looking at the communities and the neighboring uh, uh, articles and the attention paid to them. And then in addition to that, the navigation data. Uh, I think um, we already have some results as well, whether we can predict page views of a page based on uh, the neighboring uh, articles. Um, uh, how practical that would become and how much time we can buy is another question because also the resolution of the page view data bec becomes a factor here. Um, I wish I could tell more. I'm basically repeating your very good question. Um, uh, Patrick, do you want to add more? Yeah, um, it's, it's one of those things that's hard to tell because, you know, I'm studying events generally, right? It's hard to define a specific problem where there might be these sleeping beauties, where, where, where you're looking for them. I'm not explicitly looking for them. So um, so maybe the design, the design experiment is, is such that it can't, that it can't find them. Um, there's, you know, I've had some success in predicting the number of page views that an event will re will receive, um, you know, a week from the page view time series, a week before the event, a day before the event, that 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 sort of thing, and the number of page views they receive following the event in response in reaction um, um, beforehand. But that's typically for anticipated events rather than uh, rather than shocks. Um, so if, they, if there's a shock, it's obviously a lot more difficult. If, if there's some sort of anticipation, there seems to be general patterns of attention, which we, which we can predict, which we can, which we can model. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. I guess, what, yeah, I guess putting into this page view prediction paradigm, I, I guess I'm thinking like, if you took the universe of politicians and political parties on Wikipedia and said, which of these pages has like a 1% chance of seeing a uh, like skyrocketing page use sometime in the next year, uh, whether that's a problem that is even tractable or not. So well, I think it's, it's as difficult as uh, predicting, uh, you know, which YouTube video is going to be, hopefully this video that we are generating now, but it's unlikely. Uh, which video, which pop star will become the next, uh, the next hit? Uh, it's a well-defined question, but uh, not necessarily easy to to attack. Do you would have a question for one more? Time for one more question. Um, only one. Oh. <laughs> More? Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll go for go. it. Yeah, Patrick, um, I have one question, maybe hopefully it's quick. Um, so you mentioned the deficiencies and errors in the article network, and that makes me think that you have some assumptions or you have made some judgments about what is an efficient article network. Can you share a little bit more on that front? Sure. Um, I guess I'll maybe share my screen again. Um, so I think there are cases where there are obvious errors where a page is solely a sink or solely a bottleneck and that can exist that typically exists because uh, the link is um, mistyped and it refer it goes to Trump in a deck of cards rather than Trump in uh, rather than Donald Trump for instance um, I think that, that I think in those cases people can uh, agree there's, there's, there's some sort of error. The kind of inefficiencies or deficiencies um, I'm talking about, this is, as you kind of say, there's, there's, a, judgment, there's a judgment call based there. So um, I briefly mentioned the case of disambiguation pages. Um, so you would expect disambiguation pages to, um, to spread traffic to a range of possible targets because there's some ambiguity in, the, um, in which uh, which version of this particular title thing you're referring to, and you need um, you need this disambiguation page there in order to resolve the difference and direct people to the correct location. And typically, we see that they typically don't generate much traffic, and they don't act as syncs, but they typically act to a 
typically act to uh, spread traffic to a, to the to the range of article to a range of articles. Um, but we also see a kind of cluster of disambiguation pages which do the opposite. They actually act to focus traffic. Um, now, in this case, people are coming from a wide range of places to this disambiguation page, but nearly every user is going towards one destination. In this case, maybe there are, there's judgment to be made on whether this disambiguation page should exist in the first place if nearly everyone is going towards an in, going towards a particular particular target um and yeah, yeah so yeah that's the, that, that's the point of it the problem is that sometimes this is um actually qu quite uh uh it can be sensitive to short short term trends so one of the examples um i have is uh tinder so there's a disambiguation page for tinder and it refers to tinder as in fire making and tinder as in the app um, nearly everyone who accesses, accesses the disambiguation page for Tinder goes towards the app page. Um, now, do we change that now in the assumption that Tinder, the app, is going to be very important socially for the next five, ten, hundred years, which is why it should be case in the encyclopedia? Or do we say that Tinder is an app and we're going to forget about it in five years? This disambiguation page sh should should stay the same. Um, so that's yeah, that, that that that's that's one example. Um, yeah, can I uh, just add uh, one sentence to that? Uh, and I think that, that's very interesting. I think it goes back to the question of uh, if we want Wikipedia to serve as a kind of static sort of encyclopedia, or we want it to be a sort of news or uh, event driven, uh, driven websites for current affairs. I think depending on the answer, and I pretty much know that there is no clear cut answer to this question, and I think everyone thinks some or both of them. Uh, but uh, I think the judgment comes from this, basically the answer to this question, they are very related, that if we want to serve the, the user who, who is looking for Tinder today, we want to get that user to the page as quickly as possible. We don't want to introduce this kind of disambiguation page in the middle, uh, one extra click. Whereas if we do want to uh, uh, show all the other articles that have the title Tinder to the user who we know that is using for the dating app, uh, because it's an encyclopedia and we want to generate uh, this kind of serendipity as well, then I think, well, it's fine that we can say that this, this ambiguation page does not serve the purpose. Thank you. Uh, Martin, do I have any time for asking something else? Uh, sure. I, if you have more, go ahead, please. I thought this I would... wanted to, okay. I wanted to make uh, one remark about um, which Taha and others may be interested in, uh, which is around, um, this is a little bit distant than the research that you have been doing so far, but I want you to know that over the past years, we have had some discussions with UNICEF around um, how to use Wikipedia page view data to understand better how to potentially make educational content more dynamic for different parts of the world, for kids who are basically learning um, about specific topics. And the challenge that UNICEF is facing is that um, the economic predictions for certain parts of the world are pretty clear. We know, for example, in the next 10 years, where country X is going, is going to head and where it's gonna be and these economic predictions are relatively stable. Uh, the challenge that they face now is that the educational content is very rigid in the sense that we pretty much teach the same thing all across the world, independent of where your country is gonna be 10 years from now. The question is, can we have more dynamic educational content and how, can, how if we can use page view data from Wikipedia to understand that? This is a highly complex research problem, as you can imagine. We, we generally don't study and research um, children. Um, we don't know what learning means on Wikipedia really. Um, there's, there are a lot of open questions there, but I just want to put it out because this is like something recurring that we talk with UNICEF about on, an, on a yearly basis. So just know that there's interest there. If you want me to connect you to people there and like talk more about it, by all means, just let me know. It's a little bit distant, but I can imagine on the prediction, movie prediction problem, which is like one of your earlier works, 
this kind of problem is closer to that in the sense that you have page view data, which is relatively stable, and you see it over a span of time. So it's not that, you know, it's election now, the last two weeks, people are urging to check a few pages. Pay, people are likely looking for this educational content that they will need, or they should be looking for that on Wikipedia in, in a much longer time span. Uh, the other thing is that Taha, you mentioned about uh, in response to the question around like COVID-19, around the challenge of geography um, uh, associated with page view data. And I just want to put it out there that we requested a, an ex <clears throat> exemption uh, or exception to the data retention guidelines related to COVID-19. I'll put a link for what exactly that exception is here and in IRC. Um, but basically what we asked is that for the first six months of the year, from January to end of June, we collect certain type of data with the hope of releasing an aggregated version of this data uh, publicly, but hopefully it will give you more page view information that you, sorry, geographical information that you normally receive. The decision about what is what exactly is going to be released is not made yet, but I just want to put it out there that for COVID specifically, we're doing some work um, to make later research possible at a deeper level than usual. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I want to say is a shameless uh, plug into we're hiring uh, for a research engineer and a research scientist uh, for both of these roles within the team. The research scientist role is focused on disinformation. We're hiring until the end of, basically the application process is open until the end of August. So if you're listening, you're in this call and you're interested, uh, please apply. And uh, that's it. Thank you. And because I did this, maybe if you are in the call and you have postdoc positions open or any other positions, by all means, feel free to advertise. This is not the case. I think that's a good point to end. I think also we are on time. Uh, that was great. Really, really interesting. Thanks again to the speakers, everyone. Taha, Patrick, Ed, and Dimitar. Thanks for the technical support. Thanks for the for Isaac for relaying the question. And thanks for the audience and for all the questions and the discussions. I learned a lot today. And hopefully see you uh, in September for the next research showcase. Have a good day. Bye, everyone.